Friday, 510, February 14th in the Ukrainian capital. Welcome to Hormotsky's Weekly Wrap-Up. In the next 30 minutes, we'll be discussing news stories from the past week dealing with Ukraine and Eastern Europe. I'm an outsider looking in. I'm going to be asking the questions our English-speaking viewers want to have answered. Our guests, they have the background. They can give us context, and they're going to cut through the noise for us. There's a saying, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. With this week's guest, I'm sure I'm in the right room. With us today is Oleksiy Sorokin, journalist with the Kiev Post. My pleasure. And the youngest member of Parliament, me Parliament member of the Servant of the People Party, Svetoslav Yorash. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you for joining us. Our main focus this week keeps us in Ukraine. An Andrei switch happened on Tuesday morning. The head of Zelensky's presidential administration, Andrei Bogdan, a nationally controversial figure, was replaced with Andrei Yermak, an internationally controversial figure. Yermak was in contact with Rudy Giuliani, and he was privy to the perfect call between President Zelensky and Trump. I'm going to ask the journalists at the table the first question. For the past 10 months, you've been covering Andrei Bogdan. Tell our viewers why he was someone interesting to cover and what challenges there were covering him. Well, first of all, um, Andriy Bogdan was always referred as a uh, former lawyer of oligarch Igor Kolomoisky. That's because he worked with the oligarch in the past and there were many concerns that he might do it in his new job as head of Zelensky's administration. Also, Andriy Bogdan was very vocal, very expressive in his opinion, and uh, by doing so, uh, we journalists had um, sometimes a hard time following him, and sometimes uh, we had a lot to do. Uh, we had, our plate was full with uh, news, yes. He was difficult to follow, but for a member of Zelensky's own party, he representatives, represented something that maybe the party wanted to distance himself, distance himself from. Mr. Bogdan did many wonderful things in a very horrible way, and I'm very thankful for him for that. Mr. Bogdan is far more complex. He was a lawyer to many people, and he worked with many different capacities, including a great deal that he'd done for the war effort in the East. I wouldn't be as um, clear as my journalist colleague here to try and condemn him. I would say, basically, through my cooperation with him, I've seen many sides of Mr. Bogdan, and it's far more nuanced than it usually presented by the media. Sounds like you've answered this question before. That was a little bit of a practice to answer. There's no practice to answer. This is my conclusion uh, after months of cooperation with the man and uh, my honest opinion of the man. And I'm thankful for all that he has done in his role as the chief of staff of the president, basically. And Mr. Yermak's appointment is a clear indication that we have hopes for the peace summit in April in Berlin. Bring us to our next point. Mr. Yermak is supposed to be the great negotiator. You just did an article this week introducing Andrei Yermak to the public. Why don't you give us a summary of what's important about him? Well, Andrei Yermak wasn't uh, very well known before he uh, became an advisor to Zelensky. Uh, he was running a, a media company and he was uh, in close relations with uh, the president. And uh, the public uh, became familiar with uh, Mr. Yermak after uh, back-channel negotiations with the U.S., which uh, were an emphasis on uh, uh, Ukraine wanted a meeting between Zelensky and Trump, and Yermak was the man who was supposed to deliver this meeting. Uh, and also, he was the one who is credited with bringing the first in two years uh, uh, prisoner swap between Ukraine and Russia. So uh, this appointment uh, suggests that, first of all, he will continue uh, his work in this capacity, uh, and also that he was very successful in uh, negotiating, uh, particularly with Russians and uh, the Americans. I know these type of decisions aren't discussed with the general party, but what was the feeling on Tuesday? So, I mean, the feeling on Tuesday was what I said before, that 
peace prospects are closer uh, with Yermak as a chief of staff first. Second, I mean, I worked with Yermak on uh, matters of uh, launching our diaspora caucus in the parliament. I, I found him very constructive in our cooperation, not to mention that he delivered the impossible, uh, such as the prisoner exchange of some of the people that Russia time and time again mentioned that are impossible to exchange. Let me censor, for example. He has delivered that, and that proves to me that that's a man who can essentially deliver us something that seems impossible from this vestige point, that is the peace with Russia. For the outside observer, though, this is a bunch of people that don't have any experience in politics. In Ukraine, that's a boon, not a, uh, not a problem. They've got, they've got clean slates, they've Ukrainian, got no history. Well, that's what the Ukrainians wanted in the first place, and the elections in uh, both March and April uh, were we're showing that Ukrainians are tired of old-style politicians and they want a fresh start, and that's what they got. They got people who uh, either never served in office or had a very limited capacity uh, in that stance, and it's important that the people are right now are getting is that uh, they're getting people who make mistakes because they don't have this experience and uh, it's important that the people who elected them uh, know what uh, what the, that what's happening right now is what they elected. Okay, I think we'll all expecting. agree politics yeah. is hard, but sometimes at the cost of progress. If you could go back to when you were first elected, what you've learned as a young parliamentarian, what would you change? Hmm. Uh, well, besides from everything, not much. Uh, as far as parliamentary systems in Ukraine, they say they're imperfect, would be saying nothing. They are designed to basically function for the interest of the class, which has controlled situation for the longest time because of the divided parliament. We are changing that because we, for the first time in history, have a mandate, that is the majority in parliament, able to actually act in transforming this country. And we are very much acting, and we see the polls reflect the Ukrainian people's support for this. Our support is holding the same levels that we've got during the elections. And that's quite something. After okay, all, and it's the at a breakneck speed, which has been criticized, but it seems to match the speed that businessmen and lawyers are used to. So perhaps having the absolute majority also reflected the way everyone was doing business. Also, sorry, uh, I want to add that having the majority also has more pressure on the party because now. Uh, both the president's team and uh, the lawmakers, they can't defer their responsibility to another party or uh, somebody else. And that's why right now a lot of people are expecting results very quickly because they think that both uh, the president controls the parliament, uh, the government, and uh, he has uh, the power to change the country very quickly, even though sometimes it doesn't work that way. How is the Ukrainian voter going to learn what to expect. As a parliamentarian, are you trying to train them a bit at how politics works and what speed, or are you just going to keep rolling through with your legislation? Well, we are coming to shows like this to inform them about the realities of what we are doing in the parliament. We are going to the regions time and time again, meeting people, explaining ourselves. I've just been to uh, the far west of the country, meeting with the region who, which actually has three countries bordering, bordering it, and explaining our law citizenship, which is coming up and will legalize millions of Ukrainians around the world who have double citizenship, basically. Uh, so we are doing our bit as far as talking with the voters and explaining ourselves. Okay, and it's great that you're here. The current administration hasn't had the best reputation for dealing with the press, though. Do you think there's going to be a change with Yermak? Well, uh, Mr. Yermak, uh, during his first press conference as head of uh, Zelensky's office, told that uh, they, will, they will be more open. Uh, and uh, I think that's a jab at Andriy Bogdan, who was famously quoted as saying that they don't need the media to talk to the people. And I think that was one of the problems of Mr. Bogdan is that he didn't want to um, deal with uh, talking to the press, explaining the media and sometimes the people as well of what they are doing. And when you don't communicate your uh, dealings, uh, conspiracy theories uh, begin. Um, and also, uh, the problem here is that this administration never had uh, the same experience. They don't know how to deal with media because when you're a businessman, you don't have this media attention. Here, uh, the media uh, and the people as well, they look into every single detail to know what you're doing because it's important to them and it reflects on their lives. And if the administration uh, will change their um, uh, their dealings with the media and the people right now and explain what they're doing, I think that would be for the better, first of all, for the administration.
let's talk about the optics and from the outside looking in. A lot of people in the West saw Andrei Bogdan and they saw his connections to Kolomoski. Um, well, first to mention, the job of the officer president, uh, chief of staff of the president, usually involves talking with the big industrial groups in Ukraine. And I'm very glad that uh, Mr. Bogdan's diplomatic style is what they got as far as negotiation uh, about their interests or realities in our country. M again, Mr. Bogdan was a part of many v different uh, parts of Ukrainian life, different businesses, including Mr. Kolomoisky's business. But it wasn't the only one. And the fact that we are focusing in all that tells us something that media want to see. They want to see everything hand managed by some interest groups and all that. The reality is quite different. Mr. Zelensky is very much his own man who is leading this transformational change and people trust him. And they, uh, they keep trusting him as we see from all the polls. And are people going to trust him more that he's made the switch now? Uh, well, Yermak, again, uh, his appointment is a clear indication that we take our offers and our uh, promises of peace seriously. And the man who has delivered already on prisoners, on talking at, at the Normandy format in Paris, is going to lead the entire effort, which means that the focus will be even more closely linked to the actual peace process in the East. Let's talk a little bit about these negotiations. Yermak is a businessman. He obviously knows how to negotiate well, but international relations has rules of diplomacy. He was speaking with Rudy Giuliani. He was using side channels. Is this going to be the direction Ukrainian diplomacy is taking? Is the foreign ministry going to lose influence and it's going to be more this? That's what, we, that's what it looks like right now because uh, appointing a man who is known for back-channeling and dealing behind the scenes is now the head of the administration. And uh, uh, after the, his first press conference, many said that it wasn't the speech of a uh, uh, head of administration. It was the speech of uh, practically a vice president because he will lead negotiations with Ukraine's partners, with uh, Ukraine's enemies, and basically undermining the foreign ministry because, uh, as we know, uh, the foreign ministry has to do these kind of negotiations. I get a sense that you disagree. I profoundly disagree. Mr. Yermak and foreign ministry are working side by side to deliver on the peace promises, on the negotiations we are having with the world powers. Unfortunately, we live in a just world in which uh, rules of diplomacy are a non-existent concept. In reality, a lot, a lot of countries are practicing unfortunate, um, uh, fortunate approaches which we have to live with because we are Ukraine uh, and we are bound by realities surrounding us. Uh, hence, I'm very glad that basically we have a union of our foreign ministry and Mr. Yermak, who can deliver on, again, peace promises that we have made to Ukrainian people and we are trying to deliver on. Because the job here is not to play perfect, it's to deliver the peace that Ukrainian people demand. There was just a shake-up right now in the Kremlin with a, with a reshuffling of who's yes. taking care of negotiations with Ukraine. There's now a reshuffling of the administration. Is this a coincidence? Are we trying to find people that can work well together? We'll find out in April. Because, again, it's not about our conversation here or about negotiations with Washington. It's about one man and the men since the Kremlin. And his decision is either to break it or make it in April in Berlin. I am very hopeful that we'll finally see a clear timeline of Russian withdrawal and our steps to reintegrate the East, including elections, including amnesty, including many other things that Ukraine needs to finally patch the wounds that we have very much opened up over the last five years. Yermak's name is familiar in the United States because it was mentioned a lot during the impeachment deposition hearings. And we've been talking about his relation and possible negotiations with Russia. Let's talk about U.S.-Ukrainian relations and the role Yermak could play. Is he Washington's man now? Well, it's not the matter of the Washington's men. It's the matter that Washington wants to see Ukraine as a key bulwark against Russia's continued expansion in the region. And thankfully, we are receiving plenty of support from Washington. And we have bipartisan consensus on that. We want to see more of that. And that's why we will essentially work with whatever administration American people decide to put in place in 2020. Uh, and we will try to understand that the global world order is pinned on the rules that America made after Second World War, and we are very thankful for those rules because they demand global borders not to change. I can understand that you believe in territorial sovereignty, but the United States doesn't always respect the, own, the other rules that it's made. There's a new form of diplomacy going right on, on right now. We've seen that in Washington. We've seen that the way career diplomats have had to react in certain situations. 
your mock seems like he's playing with the, the new rules of the Trump administration. What's your take on that? Well, first of all, it's a bad sign if in the impeachment probe of a foreign country, your name pops up. Uh, second of all, uh, we don't know how will it affect uh, Ukrainian-American relations. Uh, we just know that this person was involved in uh, back-channeling with people who are not um, legal representatives of a foreign government, and that can have implications in the future. It may not, it may, but we don't know that, and uh, the only thing we know is that Mr. Yermak is known for dealing behind uh, behind official channels. And even though, yes, diplomacy sometimes requires that. But again, this back-channeling was the, f the basis for an impeachment probe of a foreign country. And that has to raise questions, and that has to raise flags. That was a pretty steep learning curve, too, for President Zelensky. I can remember him sitting from ex-President Trump in New York. Um, as a member of his party, what were you thinking when you watched that press conference? I saw Zelensky and Trump reiterate the basic statement, which we all believe to be true. Ukraine is a strategic partner for the United States, and we want to expand our relation in every way possible, because we understand that in the global world order, it is very important to side with America, especially if another country wants to destroy your country entirely. I think that a lot of commentators would agree there was nothing that President Zelensky could have done right in that situation. He was really between a rock and a hard place. Um, I think on this point I'm going to actually agree with Mr. Yurash that Mr. Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky did everything right uh, in the sense that he was trying to distance himself uh, as much as possible. Uh, also, uh, if we're talking about Mr. Yermak right now, who uh, is accumulating uh, vast powers. Um, it's also going to depend, in my opinion, uh, on who will win uh, U.S. elections uh, this year, because we see that uh, the U.S. is divided on whether uh, <coughs> there were any um, red flags and w there were any problems in this conversation. So I think it's important that um, Ukraine understands that it may have to react uh, on the future U.S. elections. The thing about social etiquette, the thing about diplomacy is it creates a baseline. Surprises don't happen because there's rules that people follow and you know what's going to happen. Unfortunately with President Trump, there are no rules and people don't know what's going to happen. He just said in the New York Times that he did ask for quid pro quo. He admitted it now. Now when you ask a, a partner to say one thing, and then a couple months later you say, no, no, that wasn't true. What does that do to the long-term partnerships? Again, that's exactly why impeachment proceedings were happening, but the impeachment proceedings weren't successful in the end. So I very much want to delegate that conclusion to be made by the American people, American institutions, they have. Uh, hence, we have to work with the reality that the American people, American institutions give us. And, and I respect that, that is what we will approach as far as the American elections. When American also, people choose, sure. we will work with them. And that's not our job to debate who the President of the United States is. That's a job of the American nation to choose its president. Our job is to work with whoever's in there. Yeah, it's also interesting that for Ukraine, and I was asked uh, this uh, multiple times, that for Ukraine, uh, the American impeachment probe wasn't the most, uh, wasn't the first topic on the list. It wasn't the priority for uh, the president's administration, and he said that during his uh, campaign is that uh, stopping the war and uh, bringing all Ukrainians kept uh, hostage by Russia is his main priority, and that's what I feel Yermak delivered to gain Zelensky's trust, is that uh, he is credited for speeding up uh, the prisoner swap uh, twice, uh, in September and in December. And again, we see, uh, you mentioned this a bit earlier, that in the Russian uh, presidential administration, there was also a change, and a man whose name is Dmitry Kozak, uh, was appointed third deputy head of uh, Mr. Putin's uh, administration. And right now that means that these two people who are credited to oversee the prisoner exchange, they will most likely uh, have communications because their jobs require that. And uh, I'm not going to predict anything because I don't know what's going to happen, but 
I can say that some kind of dialogue will be uh, held in the near future. If President Trump's reelected by the American people in 2020, is President Zelensky in a better position then? Well, we'll see from actions that the uh, American administration takes, but I'm very clear that the President Trump's actions have been very positive for Ukraine, including the weapons provided, including the engagement that we saw with the President in New York, and we need to judge a man based on his actions. Again, I'm very hopeful that the American people will make the choice which will keep America engaged with the world's problems because uh, America has many of the solutions, uh, and if it disengages from the world, the world suffers for it. What should outside observers of Ukraine be watching for in the next few months? What will you as a journalist be watching for, for indications? Well, obviously, uh, the appointment of Yermak uh, means that some kind of uh, negotiations and uh, dealings with Russia are possible. We should keep an eye on that. Also, uh, there's a potential Normandy format meeting in uh, March, April. We don't know the date, but it may happen soon. Uh, and Mr. Yermak was also present during the previous Normandy format meeting in Paris. He accompanied uh, Mr. Zelensky and uh, that means that something is going on and uh, there, there are negotiations, people are talking and we may uh, expect some kind of dealings. Uh, I think that it's a positive sign that there are talks but again there's people who are worried what kind of negotiations can be possible, and we should keep an eye on that. This is a question that might be unfair, but everyone likes to have good ratings. Um, President Zelensky had 73% approval. I think the lowest it's ever dipped down to is 50, and every time he brings prisoners back, it goes back up again. This has been a true success for him, and for the Ukrainian people and the families that are uh, relatives of the prisoners. Um, is he willing, with Yermak, to put more at stake, um, with Yermak as a negotiator, than perhaps in the past? Zelensky has been very clear about red lines that he has and that uh, he repeated those red lines to Mr. Putin in Paris. He'll repeat them again in Berlin and along those red lines, whatever deal comes about, will happen. So Where do you understand those red lines to be? Those red lines mean total integrity. Those red lines mean integration of our countries occupied parts as integral parts of our country, not in any capacity that will impede Ukraine's uh, choices. Uh, that includes taking care of our people, and we have very many uh, who essentially are suffering as IDPs uh, in Russia as well as in occupied territories. It includes basically Ukraine understanding that uh, in very clear fashion we're dealing with Russia here, not any puppets. That it's the discussion that we're having with Russia, hence the beauty of Normandy format is we're debating together with France and Germany against Russia. We aren't essentially in a situation where we pretend those puppets mean anything else but what puppet mess tells them. But when it comes to witnesses um, in major proceedings, Zelensky has no problem sending them to Russia to get Ukrainians back. Do you agree with that stance? Well, it's not the point of sending whoever. It, the point is getting the people back. And uh, again, our priority is never to forget about our people or our land and to always try to include them in the conversation with the future of Ukraine. And thankfully, we delivered and we continue to deliver. More than that, Zelensky said very clearly that in this negotiations that will happen in Berlin, we'll talk about the Crimean Tatars who have been taken prisoner uh, and basically to the jails in Russia. And we will ask for our citizens of Crimean Tatar origin who have suffered under Russia to be brought back to Ukraine. I know you don't have a crystal ball, and I like to think journalists don't like to predict things, but where do you think the next few months are going to take Ukraine? Well, again, I want to mention that everybody wants peace. Like, that's, that's natural. Uh, but everyone wants peace at a different price, and some people are willing to go further than others. And right now, uh, we see that this administration, uh, for example, again, I'm going to quote the first press conference of Yermak. He said that uh, he wants, uh, it's his dream that the elections in Donbas will take place in October together with the, the rest of Ukraine, but there shouldn't be foreign troops. Uh, that's an ideal scenario. Right now, we're going to see what Ukraine can offer uh, to Russia because there's, it's impossible that Russia will just leave and give us everything what we want. In every negotiation, two sides are willing to give something up. And 
it's important that Ukraine doesn't give too much up. Well, let's always remember that it's not just Ukraine discussing this with Russia, it's the entire world discussing this with Russia, uh, represented by the France and German participation. More than that, as far as discussions on um, occupied territories, Russia is paying the price already for occupying these territories, both in material and personnel costs. Hence, uh, to have it settled for Russia will also be beneficial. But I'll not be rushing to conclusions about Zelensky going th against some red lines. He had clearly re reiterated them every single time he was asked by the other side. He mentioned the press conference with Putin Crimea. He always makes the point that we aren't about to forget what our country was before all this started. And we will keep battling for our country to be back. We've covered a lot of countries right now and we're talking about Yermak's negotiation skills, but you made a very good point. It's not just Ukraine and Russia, but it's the Normandy format. It's the Minsk Treaty. It's all of these outside factors that are playing a role. How much experience does Yermak have outside of Ukraine other than with Rudy Giuliani? Well, it's not the point about, uh, it's not the point of experience we should be discussing, it's the point of results. And again, as we both said, uh, when you look at the Yermak, he has delivered already on this. So basically that makes me optimistic that we'll continue working on this and delivering those results. But again, he's not working in the vacuum. He was working with the MFA which has the instruments to apply as far as the world is concerned. I, I was just meeting with that people yesterday and basically we have actors globally and we can work with them to try and deliver the global support that Ukraine needs to get this done. And again, Yermak is not in a vacuum. He has a team, he has MFA, he's working with the parliament and we'll together try and achieve what seems to be impossible now, that is peace in Eastern Ukraine. Let's talk a little bit more about diplomatic rules and um, functioning within them. It took months and months for Ukraine to get an ambassador in the United States. What does this tie in with, too? It's a very important choice to make, and obviously to rush that choice would be a mistake. Hence, basically, we are taking that responsible path in selecting the person who can be best at try trying to uh, change the conversation we have with the states, including all the debate speculation about Ukraine that's happening on almost every day in American media now. Is Yermak going to be more accessible to the media? Because well, I hope so. <laughs> a lot of the problems in the American media, you've mentioned speculation several times, and you need to be fair to the media, though. We can only connect the dots that are provided, and if there's only a dot here and here provided, and we hear words like oligarch, and this and that, we try to do the most simple thing. I must mention that for the media, any time is campaign time. And during the campaign time, we have all the time in the world for the media. Because we're trying to explain our message, trying to convince people that we are the right team. But when it's time for governing, we also do some work. And we cannot always promise to be always there when the media is asking for it. And obviously everybody wants peace with Mr. Yermak today. Uh, but our job is to try and deliver something Mr. Yermak can then proudly tell to all the media as accomplishments of both his and his administration in general. I'm going to ask you a question about your personal experience now in politics because you're new to the game. You're, you're not new to the me media and you're really not new to politics. They've got a family history. Your father's a minister, correct? Or was well, he was a head of department, delivered Ukrainian church independence, but that's a different story. Now, you have a lot in common with President Zelensky because you're both new to this game. What experiences did can you take away now that um, if you run for re-election, you'll... Well, our job is to, in five years, have a whole different country. Uh, discussing re-election now seems to be quite impossible because they haven't delivered a wholly new country uh, already. When we accomplish that, if we accomplish that, then we can talk about future steps. But to be so bold as to be planning ahead uh, a political career when we haven't delivered on the mandate we have already is a mistake. What happens if the whole new country isn't delivered? What's the plan B? Well, uh, then thankfully we have a democracy and we have elections and people can choose uh, essentially people who can deliver on that better. But the point is they have chosen us and we in the Toba regime are voting 10 laws a day in the parliament and we essentially are transforming everything well, in this country. Right now there's one law that's blocking for three that, months that is, blocking that is, the, the parliament. Supposedly, we can try and uh, f help things along. Uh, the land reform is a huge uh, proposition for Ukraine. It was blocked for entirety of our independence and our job is to finally achieve what seems to be impossible. What Zelensky said in his presidential bid, what we have said in the parliamentary campaign, we have promised this, we must deliver this. So. It seems like we've got a lot to talk about. 
I like the fact that we covered a lot of topics. This was really informal. Right now, we're going to take a look at another news recap from the rest of Eastern Europe. A conflict between Kazakhs and another ethnic group, the Dugans, who live on the border with Kyrgyzstan, led to 10 deaths and nearly 200 injuries, with thousands fleeing Kazakhstan for Kyrgyzstan. Is Russia trying to pressure Belarus into joining it? At least that's what Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko believes. Earlier, Minsk asked Moscow for concessions on gas prices, but the Kremlin said no. Azerbaijan's surprise parliamentary elections last weekend yielded an unsurprising result. President Ilham Aliyev's ruling party claimed a majority of the seats. Massive violations happened at polls all over the country, and international observers referred to the elections as undemocratic. Post-election protests ensured, but were quickly broken up by the police, who beat and detained a few protesters and journalists. An opposition leader and former Tbilisi mayor, Gigi Ugalava, was arrested in Georgia and sentenced to 38 months in prison. The charge? Embezzlement. Other Georgian oppositionists and Western experts believe this is a form of political persecution. Thank you again to our guests, Ole Oleksii Sorokin and Svitolav Yurash. We'll be back next Friday offering an English-speaking look into the week's news from Ukraine and Eastern Europe. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We're here to inform, but we'd also like to hear from you. I'm Carrie Oderman, and that's the week's news, wrapped up. But that's not all from us. Hormozka provides news 24 hours a day, seven days a week for over five years now. The media landscape in Ukraine is changing, and here's how to make sure stories about Ukraine keep coming from Ukraine. I would like us to be heard, not only in Ukraine, but all over the world. No bread for three months. What? Not, not one, but look how many. There's bread here and there. You are going against the God. Of course, point number one. Thanks for the invitation. When will this all end? The number of political prisoners has grown. How can Ukraine? from our headquarters in Kyiv.